Yo. Party People. Wir sind mal wieder hier auf äh, Laser Land, dem Anarchie-Server ohne Regeln mit der Domain sillyhuhn.com. Alternativ auch erreichbar unter der IP-Adresse 149.202.127.134. Ähm, genau, dann würde ich sagen, let's go. Ähm, ja, also es ist ein kleiner Anarchie-Server, hier ist äh, selten was los, hier sind 20 Slots, also hier könnt ihr ähm, eigentlich immer spielen, ohne, ohne Q oder ohne Warten oder was auch immer, als, sagen wir mal, uh! also für mich persönlich ist das eine Alternative für den 2B2T-Server, ähm, ist natürlich, äh, die haben schon nicht mitgenommen, die Sachen, oder ja. Ist natürlich äh, vom, vom Stil her schon was ganz anderes. Also für die Leute, die 2B2T jetzt nicht kennen, äh, das ist ein ähm, Anarchie-Server, den es schon etwas länger gibt. Und ähm, der hat aber eine Menge Plugins, wie zum Beispiel eine, äh, eine Queue, dass man, ähm, wenn der Server voll ist, da warten kann, um dann reinzukommen und so weiter. Und äh, all diese Plugins verändern natürlich auch ein paar Dinge. Und an sich gibt es auch richtig viele Spieler und so weiter. So gesehen ist das schon ein anderer Server hier, aber es ist halt ein ähm, Anarchie-Server, sprich es gibt absolut keine Regeln und äh, keine Eingriffe von, äh, von Administratoren. Eigentlich gibt es auch keine Administratoren, nur, nur mich so gesehen, der hier potenziell Zugriff hätte auf den Server, aber ich ähm, bin ich auch nur ein ganz gewöhnlicher Spieler, wie alle anderen auch. Ähm, Genau. Und ja, schaut doch einfach mal vorbei und chillt hier ein bisschen. Äh, wollte ich noch irgendwas sagen? Irgendwas wollte ich wahrscheinlich noch sagen. Ähm, keine Ahnung. Ah, ich wollte mal äh, Video Settings, Pepper, die Brightness, Moody. Nee. Ja. Schaut euch das mal an, es hat richtig Stimmung hier unten, oder? Irgendwie fühlt sich das so oldschool an. Frü früher gab es diese Brightness-Setting äh, nicht, oder? Spinn ich. Hm. Ich weiß es gerade gar nicht, aber irgendwie habe ich das Gefühl, dass... Oder ich habe seit 5, <lacht> 6 Jahren nicht mehr gespielt mit so einer niedrigen Brightness-Setting und deswegen ist es so nostalgisch. Aber ich habe auch das Gefühl, in, in YouTube-Videos und so, früher war das gang und gäbe und heutzutage nicht. Ich weiß es nicht, aber jedenfalls hat das einen richtig geilen Oldschool-Vibe, finde ich. Und das ist schönes Licht, aber es ist natürlich eine unpraktische Setting, keine Frage. Ähm, Gerade wenn man sich irgendwo rein meint oder so. Aber, ähm, ja, schon eine, schon eine geile Stimmung, keine, keine Frage. Ja. Okay, ja, dann, äh, wir sind mal wieder hier ähm, mit Aaron Jones am Start. Äh, unserem Lieblingsofficer. Ähm, ja, vom Channel Brian Clough. Ähm, und zwar diesmal der Vortrag Intro to Secure Computing von, äh, wie gesagt, Brian Jones. Link ist natürlich wie immer in der Beschreibung. Dann würde ich sagen, let's go, oder? To introduce myself, my name is Aaron Jones. Uh, I work for the Chandler Police Department, but I do not represent the Chandler Police Department. Uh, I'm a software developer, and in addition to that, Jeez. I do all kinds of other stuff. And I also teach here at the Security Linux Users Group, and occasionally you'll see me at the regular plug meetups as well. Uh, I have a master's degree in intelligence analysis with a focus in cybersecurity. Uh, I've been doing computers for a while and been doing uh, Linux for quite a while um, since I was a, a kid. Uh, I started with the original Red Hat, I think, four point something. So that was my very first operating system that I installed that was Linux. Um, and in addition to that, 
I occasionally get up here and talk about different stuff that affects us as users and as software developers and as people who are going to be using technology. So what are we going to talk about tonight? So well, basically this is everybody. this introduction to no. secure computing, and that's kind of a misnomer, but we'll find out why. And at the conclusion of this course, you, the student, will be able to identify what a trusted execution environment is. You will be able to explain what out-of-band system access is. You will be able to identify what Intel Active Management Technology is. You will be able to describe one vulnerability related to remote management tools. But I will tell you right now, we will discuss more than one. And you will also be able to describe how Active Management Technology is bad for our freedom. So, we're going to talk about a bunch of technologies in here. I know that Intel ME or Intel Management Engine is the, the main focus of this, but for us to be able to discuss that, we're going to have to discuss a whole bunch of other technologies as well, uh, some that are supporting and others that are just sort of peripheral to the ME. But let's start with out-of-band management. Does anybody here deal with out-of-band management or has dealt with it? Yeah? Okay, so not very many people in here have done that. Uh, is everybody here familiar with the concept at least? No? A little, a few head nods? Okay, great, that's fine. Fantastic. So, out of band management is an integral part of managing a data center, providing 24 7 support, and ensuring high availability when managing a server. So, what does that really mean? What does it boil down to? Out of band management is the capability of being able to manage servers or computers remotely from the data center even when those systems are down or otherwise inaccessible. And now that sounds weird, right? Because most of us are familiar with inbound management technology. I'm going to name some of those off and then we'll get back to them here in a second. But is everybody familiar with SSH? Yeah? How about BNC? Diese Teile, die yes. außen an dem okay. Gerät dran sind. So those are all inbound management tools. Dass man das Gerät neu starten kann, wenn es ausgeschaltet ist zum Beispiel. Part of the operating system in order to communicate with that server, but generally those tools are unavailable to you whenever you have to reboot the ser server, right? You, re you reboot a server, you're not going to have a SSH connection to the box anymore. Uh, VMC goes away if the server's turned off. All of these technologies affect the server, or I'm sorry, the server, when it is turned off, affect your ability to interact with those technologies. Make sense? Okay, fantastic. Now, that sounds weird, right? Like We're about to get into some really weird stuff because we're about to talk about how to affect and work on a computer that's a, essentially turned off and un unavailable to you, okay? So if you were to work in a business where being able to work on servers was extremely important to you and you needed high availability, high uptime, and in addition to that, you needed access to those systems even when you were not local to those systems, you're going to look into a solution that provides you out of bound management. Um, because you're going to want to be able to manage that server, troubleshoot it, provide updates, and conduct any kind of maintenance that is required on that system from a remote location. You can't always have somebody on site, and some of these data centers just don't have 24-7 on-site folks there, and so this assists them in managing those tools. So that's where Intel Active Management Technology actually steps in. That's where this technology shines, and I didn't mention it at the beginning, but there is a lot of fear. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of doubt. Uh, and there's just a lot of um, rumors that go along with active management technology. Uh, and some of it is absolutely justified. I'm going to tell you that right now, and we're going to get into it. There's n I'm not going to get up here and tell you that all this stuff is great, and it's totally perfect, and it's totally fine to have in your house, and so on and so forth, because I do have... Uh, disagreements with it. So when I get to points where I have opinion in here, I'm going to try to identify that for you all. Okay? So there'll be lots and lots of facts with lots and lots of documentation to back it up, but there's going to be some opinion stuff in here as well, and I will try to identify that for you. So these businesses and enterprise level users, because they need remote access to these systems, they are going to barter and trust with their vendor of choice. And what that means is, is if you have a tool that provides you remote access to these systems, you are saying that I trust this vendor or this provider pretty much explicitly. You are giving 100% trust to whoever is providing this technology to you. And in exchange, they get the ability to actually work on these systems. Now, I have a link in here. And I'm going to open it 
real quick. And this is the install Gentoo wiki. Be careful going there. Uh, I have an archive here, uh, archive.is. Most of the links that I will show you are archived. However, if you are familiar with any kind of image board uh, related um, culture, they have a term that they like to use, which is botnet. And essentially what they're saying is that anything that requires you to trade your data uh, that conducts surveillance on you or advertises to you without your permission, they use that term botnet to refer to all of that. We have to understand that out-of-band management is truly a black box that we really have very little control over. Now, there are some open source tools, and we'll discuss them, like Redfish, which is an API. Uh, the Redfish API is open source. The Redfish API gives you access to out-of-band management tools, and generally, you can review them. But the actual physical hardware technology itself is mostly closed off from inspection by the user and really has no oversight. So when Intel created their active management tools, they created it, they distributed it, and we as users don't really have a way of reviewing what it's doing or what's going on with that system, okay? But first we need to talk about what kind of activities out of band management will actually provide us. What can this accomplish for us and why is it baked into the hardware? So we need to understand that out-of-band management is provided by a separate CPU, it's provided by a separate operating system, it's provided by a completely separate computer that is baked on board into the technology that you're using right now. I see a bunch of laptops in here. Uh, some of you still have the sticker, right, on your laptop that tells you what kind of CPU you have. A few of you, maybe, yes. Does it say vPro down at the bottom? see something like Intel i3 and then the words vPro down there? No? Anybody have that? No? Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> Was? So, Hä? Habe ich jetzt gerade nicht gecheckt? We'll get to it. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm asking these things so that we can set up for more information. Just because it doesn't say vPro down at the bottom doesn't mean that any of these technologies are not baked in. I'm going to tell you right now that if you have a CPU that was created after the year 2008 and it is an Intel-based system, spoiler alert, it has much of the vPro technology baked in and most of it is going to have uh, Intel Active Management technology baked in, okay? It may not be listed on the CPU, but a very good indicator is the indicator of vPro directly on there, uh, on the sticker. That's like, a, that's like your very first warning sign. But again, not necessarily true, okay? So by having this technology and having this stuff baked into our system, these are the things that it provides us. We can reboot or power cycle a computer, okay? So through the active management technology, we can go in and we can say, take this server and reboot it. We can change the boot order or device order on the, the system. Now remotely, okay? So you can tell that system, I want you to boot from a different hard disk, reboot the system, and get into that other hard disk remotely. You can set power thresholds. Computers using too much energy, causing problems, you're worried about it, you can start shutting items down, excuse me, in order to protect that system. We have serial console access via SSH. take a computer that you would otherwise not have access to, uh, thought process there, let's say you turn on your firewall, block port 22, you can no longer connect to it remotely. This is a method by which you can connect to the system and it's just like you're sitting there. Okay? Like you have physical access to the system. Yeah, I have a event notification. <laughs> Wie kommt das Teil ohne Port 22 raus? We can identify and fingerprint systems. We can check temperature, fans, general health state, as well as power consumption. And we can also check hard drive status and fault state. So if the system is no longer responding, we 
can go in there and we can find out why. That's pretty useful, right? This is the kind of technology that you would want to have access to in a data center in order to manage and monitor multiple systems, right? Off of that list there, is anybody sitting here and thinking to themselves about some of the things that they could use this for for abuse? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Some heads moving up and down. We have SSH access, almost as if we are sitting right there at the terminal. We can, bless you, we can boot to different drives and different devices directly off of this system. We have a lot of access here, right? And of course, like I mentioned, you have VNC, SSH, serial ports, and remote desktop tools, all of those being your inbound tools, and those all becoming unavailable when the actual physical hardware is unavailable. So you're going to see through that, this talk, there's a lot of discussion about how secure this stuff is. There's a lot of discussion about uh, words like secure, uh, words like uh, hardened. They, they use a lot of terminology here in order to give you the implication that the system is extremely safe or that this system is um, going to benefit you in ways that you may not otherwise expect. But what you will also find is that there are plenty of places, this is one of the CDEs if you're following along, where determined attackers can find methods to gain privilege to the system fairly easily and from remote terminals. Okay? So there are vulnerabilities. And I'm not saying that other tools don't have vulnerabilities. I don't want anybody to sit here and think that, well, you know, Intel, you're picking on them, so on and so forth. What they have created is a computer that sits in front of your computer that potentially has vulnerabilities that can be accessed remotely that has the sole intent of being able to control and affect your main computer that you actually interact with. Okay? And this is being shipped home to be within your home. Okay? So this isn't just technology that we're going to find in the data center. We're going to start moving towards this is the actual technology that's baked into your laptop right now. This is the technology that's baked into your home computer. For those of us who are running things like Intel NUX, um, every single Intel NUX that I have has active management technology baked right into it. Okay? Now, Intel, from what I've noticed during my research, and this may just be personal opinion here, so I'm going to preface this. They are not shy about telling you what the technology can do. Okay, this Ooh, is one clean. of the stages. Okay. They tell you, hey, we can hand you remote manageability. You can have remote control. Soll ich noch einen stick? You can simplify. Uh, they tell you what the technology does. Uh, ich and ich in den mit. Habe ich They're hier. informing people. But I don't feel that they do a very good job of putting that in the face of consumers. I don't now, know. I, I know for a fact that the DFS, and we'll get there in a moment, did come out and let people know what the technology does in a way. They said it was harmful here freedom. We'll discuss that here shortly. They let people know that the technology itself is not in a manner in which you can review it. You can't do code reviews. Uh, you can't oh boy, see what's happening. Happen. And for the most part, most people are unaware of what's happening with their systems, okay? But, again, they're very open about it. They want to enable IT managers to discover, repair, and help protect network computing assets. In addition to that, for those of you who are interested in learning exactly how to set this stuff up, I have links in here that go to tools like Radmin, where they explain to you on a motherboard exactly where the pieces are found. So they you that here. each one of these pieces is baked in to your motherboard. So Intel has their Ethernet controller, it's ANT enabled chipset, and then in addition to that you have a processor that's combined with VPro. Uh, and each one of these pieces work in conjunction to give somebody
anybody remote access to the system. Now, again, Intel is not the only company that does this. You can go out and you can buy systems. Uh, I think Dell refers to theirs as IDRAC, I-D-R-A-C. It's a similar but uh, extended technology that is Dell specific as a vendor, and they provide that same exact uh, service. I just mentioned a moment ago about vPro, and I'm going to open up this link for everybody. And on Wikipedia, there's plenty of information about vPro and some of the features that they provide. And what we know is, is that a vPro PC is going to be multi-core, uh, and it's going to either be, and it's going to be multi-threaded, okay? And you'll have either a Xeon, or it'll be referred to as a core processor, Core i3, Core i7, Core i5, okay? Uh, it will have Intel Active Management technology. It will have it. Okay? You just you can't get it without it. In addition to that, there are tools for remote configuration, and then your wired and wireless laptop network connections. Those items are Intel chipset as well, and therefore they are integrated with the AMT, and therefore the AMT is able to access those tools. Okay? And here in a little bit, we're also going to get into the trusted execution technology. And spoilers, the Intel trusted execution technology is most likely harmful to us as well. The uses for it for a normal user are not really there. Not a lot of purpose in it for us as end users, but there's a whole lot of purpose there for people who may want to do something like DRM, digital rights management, uh, or in addition to that, uh, being able to affect your ability to do cryptography. So and then some of them are going to have stuff like uh, integration of like the Microsoft Network Access Welche Protection oh and God. some of these tools that are vendor specific. And by vendor, I mean Microsoft or Cisco. Whew. And then of course, uh, Virtualization technology, there's a whole bunch of stuff baked in here too in order to give the Intel chipset. Uh, it is supposed to be an improved ability to deal with virtualized systems. But in addition to that, it also gives them the ability to access memory for each one of those virtualized systems. And therefore, if you're running this chipset, then a tool like the AMT would allow you to get into that, and then from there, you could pivot into the virtualized machines that are on the system. So therefore, if you're running something like Cubes OS, potentially, you would have a backdoor there that would allow you to defeat that operating system. Okay? There's also a disable bit. Uh, that execute disable bit can be used to prevent buffer overflow attacks, and then uh, support for things like Vista BitLocker and their trusted modules. And you're going to see this over and over and over. You're going to hear words like trusted and secure and all this other stuff. But really what it comes down to is trying to take the ecosystem and, and build it into a little tiny box that supports very specific companies. Oh, krass, ist das uh, viel Gunpowder, was da reingeht in so TNT. So I'm going to actually take this out of that mode so that I can read this to you. Ja, Ripple Lightroom an der Stelle, ne? Eigentlich kann ich die Raketen auch wegwerfen. Bis ich wieder eine Lightroom bekomme. Keine Ahnung, wer ich eine bekomme. Oh mein Gott. Oh mein Gott. Wie viel Schaden machen die denn, bitteschön? Ist everybody hier generally familiar mit... Alter, hat er mich. Ich hab noch meine ganze Rüstung an. Der hat mich fast weggesnackt. Oh. Das ist auch immer gerne drüber, ne? 
to essentially take whatever is running on that box and have complete and total control over it. Okay? Just to break it down for you at the easiest level, if you're running this technology, potentially somebody else could have access to all it's of the memory, there, all the encryption keys, anything that's going in and out of the box, just a ton of access. A log, right? What's that? Not log. So we'll get into that in a minute because theoretically there are logs, oh. but they're inaccessible to us as users. Okay? So like I said, um, I have a link here that discuss a little bit more about it. Uh, just to kind of describe to you where they believe that it's dangerous and why it's dangerous and some of the problems that other people have. Really right here is a very, very mid-level reiteration of everything that I'm telling you. You know, it talks about power control, BIOS configuration, and upgrade, disk wipe, system reinstallations, console access, all of the things that can be done. And in here, actually, I'm going to just real quick zoom in on a word right there, 3G modems. We'll get to that as well. Okay? Uh. Haben wir alles? Soll ich noch die äh, Dia-Blöcke mitnehmen? Das ist halt jetzt die so, Frage. We know that the Free Software Foundation believes that this technology is harmful to us and our free. We know that giving somebody else access to our systems is probably harmful to us. Right? Now, do we have a way out of that? I'm going to say it now, but I'm going to reiterate it at the end for those of us who are sitting here thinking, well, I'll just dispose of this system and I'll switch over to AMD. AMD has very similar technology that is baked into their systems now, particularly with systems like Ryzen. So we are very quickly moving away from any technology vendor who doesn't provide remote access. And there's reasons for this, and some of this is going to be semi-conjecture, but we can thank our friends in Australia for some of the notes that allow us to go in and see what's actually happening uh, at the government level that's pushing for this, okay? So now we know that AMT exists, and we know it's out in the world, right? So what do we have right here? Well, this is Shodan. And for those of you who haven't taken my previous class on Shodan, Shodan is a search engine, which is for the Internet of Things. You can go on to Shodan, and you can type in to look for specific things that are exposed to the Internet, and then you can locate those things. Now, if you look right here, I'm looking for HTTP. I'm looking for Intel Active Management. And so what I'm looking for are exposed servers that have the HTTP login specifically for their active management. Now, before everybody gets excited, because we all see that number up there, 5,222 hits, right? Look at all these systems that are vulnerable. Well, we're going to find out here in a few seconds that there's actually less than that, and there's a reason for that. I think everybody in here, I want you to think before Honey I get to it, the reason why we would see 5,222 vulnerable systems when that may not be the case. And we, if, for those of you who have taken this class, yeah, also eine class with me, you should already know oder? what's going on ja, here. Anybody want to take a guess before we move forward? Oh, that's was anderes, ich mal Thank you, Honeypot. Oh, yay! Yes. Good. It's the way to think. Aber so viele. So we have a whole bunch of systems here that are potentially Honeypots. All right? Hells up. But yeah, okay. they're here. Ich. Each of them reporting Intel Active Management. Now, we have these web pages, right? What might be a way that we could use to potentially Better. drill down and figure out which one of these systems are honeypot? Hmm. Potentially look at the headers, right? Pull the headers for the site, compare them, see how many of those headers come back exactly the same. Start looking for fingerprinting. Try to figure out what's extremely similar between each of these systems. If you look at something like Cowery Honeypot, uh, and you check their Etsy password, the Etsy password for every single Calorie Honeypot is going to be the exact same Etsy password. So those are the, those are the kinds of thought, process that, pro, thought processes that we want to think about when we're seeing stuff like this. We want to figure out how we're going to fingerprint these systems and what the similarities oh, that we found between every single Honeypot. Because you would take and you would pull this data using the API, pull the header. Wieso erklärt er gerade, wie man Honeypots detected? Hä, also Honeypots detecten? Also bisher habe ich noch alles verstanden, dass, also auch die sketchy Sachen, dass er erklärt hat, wo man jetzt ähm, 
Rats bekommt und Trojaner und hast du nicht gesehen, dass die Open Source sind, halb auch erklärt, wie das funktioniert und wie man damit unterm Radar bleibt und so. Das macht alles meiner Meinung nach noch Sinn aus einer Whitehead-Perspektive, um sich in die äh, Angreifer reinzuversetzen. Aber Honeypots identifizieren, das jetzt an die Öffentlichkeit weitergeben, also das macht ja nicht nur Sinn, wenn man selber Honeypots hosten will, aber ich glaube nicht, dass das hier ein Tutorial ist, Honeypots zu hosten. Das klingt eher, wie als würde er erklären, wie man, äh, naja, ein System mal angreift. Ne? Aber vielleicht, äh, ja, keine Ahnung. Also finde ich jetzt, finde ich fragwürdig, fragwürdig, <lacht> dieses Wissen weiterzugeben, meiner Meinung nach. Aber Klar, also Wissen, Wissen weitergeben ist natürlich immer eine, eine nette Sache und so, aber ne, ist schon sketchy meiner Meinung nach. The same. And which ones are different, right? Because undoubtedly within this 5000. Ja klar, kann man jetzt denken, wow, ich mache mein System sicherer, ich mache ein Honeypot, aber ich passe auf, dass mein Etsy äh, Passwort äh, unterschiedlich ist, damit Angreifer mich nicht finden und dann bla di bla, aber ich meine, einen Show, den Honeypot, schützt ja eigentlich nicht wirklich dein eigenes System, oder? Also. Never. 22 Systems? Some of these are real. Right? We can take a wild guess and say, at least a handful of them have to be real. So, are there exploits? Now that we know that some of this stuff is out there? Absolutely there are exploits. Here's one written in Python right here. So right here on GitHub is a proof of concept for being able to get into these systems. So the vulnerabilities are out there. We know about the vulnerabilities. And individuals go out to get on GitHub and write proof of concept code for being able to exploit those vulnerabilities. And then from there, as we all know, these are jumping off points for further research, right? Because generally, what you will find is that if you can identify a CVE and you can identify a problem within the code, oftentimes that problem either shows up somewhere else or whenever they had a fix for that problem, that will oftentimes not entirely fix the problem, okay? We've seen this multiple times throughout the years. So this right here is a jumping off point for your research. If you wanted to see, okay, so this was an effective vulnerability during this period of time, this is what it affected. Now I completely understand this concept right here. Well, how can I move that just a little bit to see if I can still fall through a crack? Ooh, what's happening here? And then of course, I link to The honeypot for Intel anti firmware vulnerability. So if you want to get GitHub and you know that we have a vulnerable version of AMT that's out there in the world, well, here's the honeypot directly for it. So you can pull this code down, set this up, and then you can monitor if somebody tries to break in and what kind of commands that they run and such. And then there's also a JTAG uh, proof of concept that somebody's building. Again, available on GitHub. Tons of information on how it works, uh, different information on how they're attempting to uh, reverse engineer the system. Lots and lots of stuff in here. It's a very fascinating read, if for nothing else, but to understand what people are looking at when they're trying to get in. Now, some of you are probably sitting in here and thinking to yourself, but I saw a Python script that said that it could disable This is from a few years back. They had a method by which you could turn the ME off on certain processors. That methodology is defunct. You can't do that anymore. And for those individuals who claim that they are turning off the ME, uh, they are turning on are something else. As researchers, though, is you can turn off the ME, but once you do so, the signals that were being passed to the processor are no longer there. And so the processor is under the. Um, 
it becomes under the impression that it's been stolen. And so you can get about 30 minutes to 45 minutes worth of use out of the processor before the processor shuts off. Oh, shit. It walks itself. And so we will go into that as well because there's a whole bunch of uh, notes and different documentation about how that works. But if you try... Jetzt auch noch eine Anleitung, wie man einen Prozessor stiehlt. Ehre. ...to remove the ME at this point on most of these processors, it bricks the processor. You cannot do so anymore. Previously, on certain versions of the processor, it was a possibility. Today, you really can't turn it off. Meh. What about other out-of-band access tools? Do they exist? Absolutely. Again, Intel AMT is not the only one. Is anybody using something other than Intel AMT in here? Yeah? For out-of-band management? Okay. Ähm, um, ja, Leute, ich glaube, ich bleibe so doch noch ein bisschen hier. Include IPMI, um, MCTP, auch wenn ich endlich keinen Platz mehr habe. Aber... Ja, wohin soll ich denn gehen? Also ich habe ja kein Zuhause. So... Most of us in here are probably wondering about the 3G uh, setup that is supposed to be secretly integrated into these processes, right? That there's some sort of method by which uh, bad actors are able to secretly tunnel their way into your system. Well, I can tell you right now, if you're asking, is there a secret 3G mobile chip that gives backdoor access, like this news article says, Uh, it says, secret 3G Intel chip gives Snoop's backdoor PC access, and it discusses how some of these chips have this anti-theft technology. I can tell you right now. It's not secret. No, there's no secret. <laughs> there's a technology brief on it. Intel put this out. to let you know that yes, they can get into your system. Yes, they have out-of-band access to these chips. And yes, they have methods of communicating with your computer by which they can do anything from shutting it down to gaining signals so they can figure out where the system is located and so on and so forth. Uh, they can even gain notifications via messages sent over an IP-based wired or wireless LAN. They can send encrypted SMS text messages over a 3G network. They can resume the system from standby. They can check for accessible login attempts. And they can also set the computer up where if it doesn't check in with a central server after a certain point of time, the laptop itself can go into a theft mode or notify somebody. Okay? Tons and tons of technology is baked into these systems that is available for somebody else to be able to use. Now, pretty much all of us in here have systems that have this technology baked in. Is anybody actually using it, like for personal use? No? Yeah. I don't know of a single person at this point, and I go to a lot of different places and talk to a whole lot of different people. I don't know anybody who is using this technology on a personal level. Okay? I, I have seen Aber könnte man mal machen, wenn sie schon da ist, oder? Who use it for their business, and that makes sense. But I have not seen this technology in use in anybody's home. Warte mal, heißt es, ich kann zum Beispiel meinen Laptop anmachen, während er aus ist, über eine Remote Connection mit dieser Technologie? Habe ich das richtig verstanden? Es wäre ultra geil. Weil mein, mein Setup momentan ist, ich spiele an einem Laptop und das Video läuft an einem anderen Laptop und ich habe irgendwie so ein paar skanky Scripts, die halt irgendwie, wo ich hier ein Video starten kann und dann irgendwo das ähm, da auf dem Zweitbildschirm startet oder auf dem zweiten Laptop ähm, aber ich muss den immer manuell anmachen und auf diesen Knopf drücken und der ist schon ein bisschen weit weg äh, wenn ich das mit dieser Technologie automatisieren könnte das würde mein, mein Workflow ziemlich äh, erleichtern also wenn wenn das Zeug, das Evil-Zeug schon da ist, ne? kann man es ja mal probieren, damit was zu machen. Aber ich frage mich, wie user-friendly das ist. Das ist wahrscheinlich auch nicht dafür gedacht, dass das irgendwer... Äh, keine Ahnung. Mal sehen. 
Vielleicht erklärt er noch was. Ja, es sind in den Slides, ne? Ist dann 34 Minuten, sollte ich mir mal merken. Ne, egal, ich schaue einfach in den Slides. Ähm, das schaue ich mir später mal an. Vielleicht mache ich das echt mal. Ja, Leute, ich äh, habe mir letztens mal gedacht, man kann überall immer das Schlechte sehen und die Gefahren und hast du nicht gesehen. Oder man versucht es auch einfach selber zu verwenden und selber die, die, die Vorteile daraus zu ziehen, wenn es schon da ist. Immer positiv durchs Leben steppen, Leute. Immer, immer positiv durchs Leben steppen. Ne? <lacht> Meine Daily Weisheit hier am Rande. Ja, also ich weiß nicht, ich finde es ähm, natürlich interessant, also wenn jemand was zu sagen hat und wenn jemand auch was weiß und den äh, Speaker ergänzen kann, aber ich, ich fühle immer so einen richtig negativen Vibe, so den Speaker so zu sagen, nein, das stimmt nicht, da so reinzuwirken, oh, da kriege ich immer äh, nicht Fremdscham, sondern was kriege ich denn da, das ist irgendwie ein richtig unangenehmes Gefühl, finde ich, ich weiß nicht. Ja, aber es ist auch schwer, das irgendwie äh, freundlich zu sagen, ne? ich meine, der, der hat jetzt, der ist den ja nicht angefahren, aber das war schon, äh, Wisst ihr, was ich meine? So, wenn, wenn da vorne einer steht und einfach den Leuten was beibringen will und dann einer reinwirkt und sagt, nein, das stimmt so nicht und aber klar, ja, es äh, 
hilft natürlich gegen ähm, die Verbreitung der, der, der Fehlinformationen, dass Nolan das alles selber verbreitet hat, aber unangenehm. Er schaut doch gerade so ein bisschen, uff, was, was sage ich jetzt dazu? Vielleicht weiß er das auch nicht besser und dann, ja, ist halt schon ein bisschen bloßstellen, aber mal. I not the class for it, but yes, I, what you're saying, okay, uh, I'm not going to argue with you, but I think that some of the methods that he used, uh, I don't entirely agree with them, but of course I'm on the other side of the boat, right? Uh, it, there's, there's the, but, the, but he didn't directly do them. He, he can, had other people doing that, um, and uh, from your side of things, He's a, from a legal perspective of you did this thing. He didn't actually do that. He did something else. And, and while there, especially from somebody on the other side, you might have certain things to say about the methods he used. Sure. But let's at least try to, yeah, I just want to be more accurate about what it is. Sure. How he did. So it's just like stealing a TV. So let's say that he picked up a TV walks down the street. I'm, I'm going to segue over into this just for a second. <laughs> he picks up the TV. He stole the TV. Uh, he was allowed to watch the TV. It was in the middle of a building, right? He could have turned the TV on anytime he wanted to, but instead he picks it up and he walks out the door with it. And he hands it to somebody. And he says, check out this TV. Do whatever you want with it. You guys just make the decision. I don't want to be part of it. And so they part it out, sell it, whatever it is that they do. He's still part of that. And he still made the decision to give them that TV. And uh, generally within that, not a lawyer, not your lawyer, not anybody's lawyer, but I would not be surprised for somebody to pursue conspiracy on that. Just because you're part of it, right? So, but I hear you, there's semantics, and semantics are important. Well, and there's, there's a huge difference. So, so the liability doesn't necessarily change. Sure, but what was done, he didn't, he did not just release all of the documents um, because there are a lot of documents that he gathered that were not released uh, where other people have. And so he, while you might agree, you might think that he did not achieve what he was trying to do, he was trying to be more responsible about how he was releasing the documentation. He thought it needed to come out, but he wanted to be responsible about how he did that by having checks on, on what was coming through versus turning them over to somebody who just apparently hates everything to do with the U.S. and throws it in the um, And, uh, but it doesn't necessarily change his liability or his culpability. Okay. That, that is correct. Agreed. Uh, so going back to this, see where I'm at. Okay, so this is where we start getting into the Five Eyes stuff, which came out during that. That was part of that process. The Five Eyes documentation did come out. And uh, this right here, for those of you who are interested, is a look at Five Eyes, the intelligence clubs, all the individuals who are members, what they're doing. This right here is just an open access documentation on who's members within this, we use the word club, and some of the things that they do. Uh, There is five eyes, and then there's nine eyes, and then it expands. There's several different groups that exist, okay? And we know that. We know that there's data sharing. There's data sharing both locally. There's data sharing globally. There's uh, a whole lot of stuff going on. For those of you who are interested in that, this right here, if you fall into here, mein off of my site, lange, hat das Unbreaking, tons of information on it. Unbreaking, looting, However, Schwert geht echt gut ab. Interest. Ja, that's nice. Das macht zwar nicht viel Schaden, aber das passt. Looting, Looting ist geil und ähm, Unbreaking auch. So, da Mending noch drauf klatschen, wäre ich ja, ein bisschen schaden. Das ist ja 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 Now this is, of course, this is known as metadata, and we all know that term, we've talked about it in here a whole bunch of times. And that contains pertinent information relating to the phone call, except for the contents of the call itself. Now, we also know from experience, and from seeing this stuff in the news, that the contents doesn't necessarily matter. 
And so the metadata is quite powerful. And in addition to that, we've gone over metadata in here several times, and I've shown how to use it, and some of the methods of which you can gain metadata, and how you can take that in order to build a better picture. And we've talked about a whole bunch of this intelligence analysis. Mir fällt gerade auf, dass es richtig praktisch ist, dass unten in der Kiste so viel Lava ist. Die kann man dann schön, wenn jemand hier vorbeikommt, nehmen und über das ganze Teil hier schließen, äh, schießen, äh, schütten und somit das Loch schließen. Ähm ja, und dann noch so ein bisschen Wasser drüber kippen und dann äh, ist das ganze Loch hier am Sack. Ah, oh, ja, äh... Aber ich glaube, ich lasse die da. Oder waren da überhaupt Lava-Eimer? Ich glaube schon. Da waren auf jeden Fall ein paar Eimer. Ja, ich denke, da waren noch ein paar Lava-Eimer. Aber ich meine, die vier Lava-Eimer wird schon erst niemand nehmen, um hier alles kaputt zu machen, oder? Ich weiß es nicht, aber fällt mir nur gerade so auf. Also wenn das, äh, wenn mich gerade jemand hört und wenn dieses Video, äh, für den seltenen Fall, dass dieses Video wirklich jemand schaut an dieser Stelle und mir zuhört, ähm, bitte einfach nicht machen. Okay, danke. <lacht> In here? But what really matters is how expensive that is. Because we've been talking about 3G networks, we've been talking about all this different technology that's being used, we're talking about the ability for all of these computers, pretty much since 2008, to be able to be communicated with in some way. And that takes a lot of backbone, right? Not backbone of people, but internet backbone. You need infrastructure. You need infrastructure for moving data, you need infrastructure for all of these systems You need people in order to execute these warrants. You need uh, tools built so that they can actually do the job of extracting the data. There's a lot of stuff going on here, right? Very expensive stuff. It's a lot of money that's spent. So since spying is a full-time job, and these companies need a way of being able to pay for that stuff, How are they getting the money? So right here Texas. is sort of an example that doesn't necessarily apply exactly to what we're talking about, but a lot of people don't understand. Uh, there is a concept, and I actually linked to it here, called black budget expenditure. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can figure you could read through uh, at your leisure that explains how you still have to keep a ledger of the money that you're spending even though people can't know what you're spending that money on. And there's projects where money goes to, but you can't just out and out say, this is what I'm spending that money on. So that's where a hammer, which is actually a M203 grenade launcher that costs $640, that grenade launcher becomes a hammer. That box of nails that's extremely expensive, that's M203 grenade launcher ammunition, 40 millimeter grenades. That's where you have a purchase that looks like one thing, but is another. And you see that at every level. Like even within criminal organizations, uh, you'll hear them discuss like selling car parts. I have 40 mufflers, but what do they really have? They have 40 kilos of cocaine. So it's not a strange or abnormal concept not anything that people aren't doing all over the place. It's just different levels, different expenditures, oh, and different items idea. that are actually being bought. That's all. Whether it's the lowly drug dealer to the high and mighty general, it's the exact same concept across the board. Uh, and if you're really, really interested in black budget expenditures, you can actually look into a lot of the stuff that happened during the Vietnam War <laughs> and the way that they would funnel money in and out of different countries that surrounded Vietnam during the war in order to buy and uh, trade equipment. And there's tons and tons of stories about that because there's lots and lots of soldiers who have come back and actually talked about it. So when we're talking about $400 billion dollars in public money that was earmarked for these companies that have essentially disappeared, and the money is no longer there even though it was supposed to be for improvements, and it was supposed to be tax breaks, and it was supposed to be all of these different things that inject capital into these companies, but all of it just sort of disappears. I don't personally, and again, this is personal, I don't personally think that money vanished. I don't think that it just disappeared. If I had to make a guess, I would believe 
that it would be very easy to state we are giving you X amount of dollars for this thing. And even though we are the government and at any time we can execute any kind of search or figure out what's really going on, and which we essentially have not, even though we know that that money has been injected somewhere and nobody's gone after it, it would be very easy for that to be money that is put into a system specifically designed for spying, for increasing surveillance, for being able to hire the people necessary to be able to do this stuff. Again, personal opinion, uh, but when you look at the amount of money that's missing and the amount of money that would be required for them to be able to integrate all this stuff, I think that it starts to show parity. So let's move to Minix. Anybody here know what Minix is? Anybody here know that Minix is probably the world's most popular operating system with the sheer number of installations? No? Yeah. If you had to count the number of computers that have Minix installed on them, most likely Minix would be the number one operating system across the world. Anybody want to take a wild guess why without reading what's up on the board? is what AMT is running. So for the Intel AMT to function, it requires an operating system, and that operating system is Minix. And so Minix is installed on every single Intel-based computer since 2008. Every single one. Did you say it hasn't been upgraded? <laughs> <laughs> so what does Minix actually provide? Well, guess what? It powers a full networking stack. It gives you a file system, it gives you drivers, and a web server available on what? nearly every computer in the world. That's, that's weird, right? It's a lot of things that are available to us off of that operating system processor on every this. single computer on the planet. What? Now again, Minix is generally running in ring negative three, and it's pretty much never touched by the user of the computer. Now I've asked several times, you know, for personal experience in here, and who's done what with their computer, and who has the in Intel AMT, and who's using it, and so on and so forth. Pretty much none of us in here have any access to Minix on the system, and none of us have touched it, okay? Like, we already know that in here. Just off of the questions that I've asked, the answers that we've gotten, we know that we have it, but we can't access it. But what does it really mean to us? Well, if we want to take it to the most base level, Minix and the Intel ME has total and undisputed control over your computer, 100%. It has access to the memory. It has access to everything that you're doing in real time as it goes across your system. So network traffic, it can monitor that. Or have I seen anything about kind of sign the golems? It is the ultimate man in the middle. But what is Minix actually? Well, it's a POSIX compliant Unix-like operating system that uses a microkernel architecture. That's that's it. Actual full blown operating system. If you go to the Minix webpage, you can pull down an ISO, you can install it in a virtual machine, and you can play with it. Uh, for those of you who are interested in a little bit more information about that, whereas everything that I'm talking about here is full sensation Linux, oh, well, archives seem to be down on this one, I'm sorry. At this time, uh, archive.is has not been very reliable for me. So what about that trusted execution technology I was talking about? Oftentimes you're going to hear your VPro stuff uh, push with the, the Intel trusted execution technology. Is AMT and TXT the same thing? No. Okay, they are different. Uh, however, where you find TXT, you will also find AMT. Okay, it just so happens that that VPro technology powers or is a um, good advertiser for each one of these technologies being integrated onto the chip. Now the Intel trusted execution technology is a method by which developers can use computer power, or I'm sorry, computing power provided by a separate OS from their currently in use OS to protect data and tools. And AMT is for actively managing the hardware and OS using a separate OS and tool set to do so. So we're have an operating system 
so that we can operate the system. <laughs> okay? That's, that's where we're at in the technology realm right now. Now, there's a really good primer. And hopefully this will load. So this is another archive. Good. There's a great primer on uh, TXT available directly from Intel with lots and lots of information about what Intel AMT does, what TXT does, the differences between them, and where you're going to see these technologies apply. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that TXT is generally harmful for your freedom, and the reason why is because TXT is going to generally be used for DRM, or digital rights management. Okay? If you're like me, you don't like DRM, and you're pretty pro-freedom, okay? And so, the TXT allows you to have an operating system that is sitting there that when, let's say, you add a Blu-ray disc into your computer. Now, Blu-ray discs are encrypted, right? And, or when they're a movie, not like something that you burned yourself, but one that you went out and purchased. So you went out and purchased yourself a movie that's a Blu-ray disc, you place that in the computer. The computer actually has to go in and decrypt that Blu-ray disc for you to be able to watch it because they don't want you to pirate it. They don't want you to make a copy of it. They don't want you to be able to do anything with that information unless you have permission to do it. So the TXT would store the encryption keys and would have the capability of decrypting that disk on the fly for you, but you would not have access to that information unless the TXT says it's okay. It's to keep you out. Does that make sense? That is not to secure your data. That is to keep you from seeing what's inside. That's why it's trusted. It's trusted for a company somewhere. It's trusted for the NPAA. It's trusted for somebody else. It's not trusted for you. Okay? Big Brother approved? Correct. Big Brother approved. It is a method by which somebody else can control the information that's inside of your computer. Now, <coughs> excuse me. I have part of that primer on the site itself. And really what it breaks down to here is the TXT defines an area in your computer where somebody can put information that they want to keep safe from you, the user. It's really what it breaks down to. Uh, another use for this technology that I saw was in Internet of Things in which people are trying to add Bitcoin to devices. So like, you would have your Bitcoin wallet, it would be stored inside the TXT, you would have no way to access it, but your refrigerator, whenever you run out of milk, would be able to go out and spin your Bitcoin and get you more milk. These are the thought processes that they have with the way that this system is gonna work, okay? I really dislike the word games that are played here on a personal level because, again, it comes into trusted, active management, secure, hardened. All of these words are thrown around over and over and over, but really what it is is it's a method of letting you know that you as a user don't have access to any of this stuff. Okay? It's secure against you, the user, not against somebody else. And then, of course, also as part of that TXT and built in, is the, the access to the virtualization stuff. So if you follow this rabbit hole and you start reading about it, you go through what the way that that system works, you can actually find out that, yes, if you're using something like Cubes OS and you have a system that's highly virtualized, well, that ring negative three system sitting down there at the bottom still has access to all of those boxes. Okay, all of that data is still available. All the memory management, all of those items can still be accessed. And I've already said it once, I'm going to say it again. Do buzzwords like trusted and secure mean it is secure? More CVEs for each one of the processors. What about that TXT? Is that perfect? Nope, buffer overflows. So when you're reading all of these documents, going to repeatedly tell you how impervious it is to being broken into, how safe it is, 
how all of your data that's in there is safe and so on and so forth. And all of the buzzwords, but again, here's a buffer overflow for that situation right there. And I'm a strong believer that any kind of complication is always going to bring, uh, breed insecurity. So here's another unspecified vulnerability in the Intel Trusted Execution Technology, or the TXT. So we talked about a whole bunch of these, right? We have a whole bunch. So warning, big red flashing lights again. Here's public opinion from me. This is my opinion, okay? My future forecast. We are moving very quickly to what amounts to digital circuits. Okay? We really and truly are, and if you look at farmers and what's going on with like John Deere, we're very similar to that, or at least moving towards that. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, John Deere rents tractors to people, but you're not allowed to repair them. If they break, oh, yeah, and just to show my the tractor, oder? it's not yours to do something with oder it. Anders, they they it schon mal or they will sue you for messing with it. And I believe the court cases are still ongoing. Uh, and that has not been a decision that has been made yet, but they don't own their tractors. They don't own the technology that they use to make them. Now, they're paying for it, and the argument is, is that they should be able to do something like repair, and the argument is called right to repair, but they can't. So let's look at the definition of a serf real quick. What is a serf? Well, it's a person who labors or works on land owned by a lord. Old tiny talk, right? Somebody owns the land, somebody else works it, you're a serf. <coughs> now, a serf is not a slave. They are, however, obligated to exchange labor for survival using the tools provided by a lord. Same with us. Anybody here work in IT? Yeah, a few of us, right? I see some hands going up. A few of us in here work in IT. So... We have systems and devices that hold our data, our data, information that we put into these systems, right? However, we are quickly moving towards segregated and balkanized corners of the internet that will be provided by company lords who rent us the tools and technology that we will use to enforce our own fields. We will not own these computers. We will have tools like, what is the memory technology I hate? Complain about it all the time in here, right? Keine Ahnung, wovon der Rede ist. Yeah, the AM, it's Intel's memory. Okay. Ich habe schon so viele Videos von dem Jungen gesehen. Is that gesehen. Octane? Yep, Octane. Okay. So Octane memory, which is supposed to speed up the access of cloud data, where eventually your systems will essentially have nothing but Octane memory in them because you're going to have a cloud connection that's supposed to be always on, and all of the data that goes into the system will be pushed up to the cloud where it will be reviewed, and Ooh. somebody else will make a decision on whether or not what you're doing with that data is okay or not. You won't keep it on your system. Ooh. Okay? Now, right now, one of the methods that this is accomplished by is through a tool called Dropbox. Some of us use Dropbox, right? Anybody in here? Yeah, I see some head shaking. Some of us use Dropbox. So when you upload an image to Dropbox, what happens to that image? They do look at it. They take your image and they hash it, and then they send it to a system to verify that that image is not a known child pornography image. Okay, so they take a hash. Stark, then have a fette database von lauter child pornography uh, image hashes. Ja, lol. Aber das ist ja nur known. Hä, hey, das macht ja... Hm. Ist das effektiv? Ja, vielleicht. Keine Ahnung. Aber geil. Muss man sich mal vorstellen, dass sie so eine fette Database davon haben. Also ich... Das sind ja nicht die actual Bilder, aber trotzdem funny irgendwie. Of child pornography. And they take caches of all the images that you're uploading to your system. And they compare them. And there's a program for that. Okay? Most cloud service providers are doing aber wieso sind die dazu verpflichtet so, oder haben die da Bock right drauf? Now, push our information up to a cloud and that information is reviewed and it's checked and in some ways rightfully, right? Some of these people deserve to get caught absolutely 
but we allow somebody else to decide whether or not the information that's on that computer is okay or not. Right now, it's something that most people would find acceptable and acceptable to behavior. Later, as that information is pushed up to a cloud or pushed up to a system that is no longer within our ownership and somebody else gets to make a decision, potentially you could be pushing something up like maybe a letter to a congressman or maybe a uh, picture that you took or drew that you consider in protest to something and somebody reviews that and decides that that's a very negative thing or that they don't like it or uh, whatever algorithm that they're using in their AI for reviewing text, flags, whatever it is that you're doing, and then that becomes a problem. Now, right now, we're not at that level yet, but it's a potentiality. What's that? Facebook. <laughs> yes, Facebook does something very similar. Twitter. Yeah, I guess you're right. We're there. We're there. We're at that point where you can put something that somebody else finds offensive, that their algorithm has been designed to find offensive, and then they will trim it and take it away from you. Okay? But we're using somebody else's platform, but we're also using it, what, voluntarily, generally, in a way? Like, you don't have a lot of platforms you can go to if you want to be able to speak to a large, wide audience. However, nobody's forcing you to have a Facebook. Nobody held you down and tattooed a Facebook ID to your arm and told you this is what you're going to use to log in with from here on out. Like, we're not there yet. Except for lots of corporations are respecting LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook type of things. Or at least they want to be able to search what you've done on those uh, before considering uh, you as a candidate. Yeah. Which, again, that goes back to, are you to work at that job. I mean, it's, your, it's still your choice, technically, but you're right. It's your livelihood. So is it your choice? To say, when, when, when even fast food workers have to go through this, they're expected to have a LinkedIn account. The rest of this is for you. Yeah. Well, when I was getting this job, they asked me for, what's your, what's your social media? We need to see it. For my job right now, we need to see your social media. And I sat down and I told them, look, I don't have one. I do not have a social media. And so, well, and I told them, I will make you one, and I will give you one right now. Like, we can sit here at the computer, and I'll make one just so you can see it, and then that's it. <laughs> and they laughed and said, you know what? We got a whole bunch of people here who don't have social media, and it's true. It, it, but it's the culture. The, I work in a job in a place where that's an accepted culture, and there's a lot of places where that is not, and they're using it as your, your cover letter for your resume, really which whether or not that should be legal or allowed or I, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that would again be personal opinion. But as it stands right now, technically, uh, since they can't, they can't force you to have one, but you're right, if they're asking you for one and you don't produce one, potentially you're gonna have your resume thrown in the trash. So let's think about that for a second. Imagine that you purchase a computer bring it home and you set it up. Now that box that you keep in your home is going to provide basic access to a remote data center and all of your data is stored in the cloud. And the system you keep in your home is monitored and controlled remotely and every action you take is verified for acceptability within whatever parameters are pertinent at the time. And once that computer is plugged in, somebody else is able to turn it on, they can turn it off, they can access full network capabilities, and they can activate the microphone or cameras at their discretion without you having any say in the matter. Most of us in here have probably seen the very, very famous picture of Mark Zuckerberg where he put tape over his camera and over all of his microphones and several pieces of his computer is taped up, right? He knows, he knows that he can turn these things on, that that is a method of being able to take a look at somebody. Other people know that as well. It's not a secret, okay? If you read some of the stuff that I've already linked you up here and you start going through that, you will be able to very quickly see that somebody else can go in and they can turn on the microphone, they can turn on the camera, they can turn on the ability, excuse me, to be able to see what is going on around the computer. Has anybody here ever used anti-theft technology on their laptop that allows them to turn on the camera? No, nobody in here? Okay, well it exists. It is out there. Uh, if you've ever worked in like a school, uh, you have probably received the warning of not turning that on while the computer is in the home of your students because 
many schools have gotten in trouble for sending computers home with kids. And then while those kids have the computers at home, somebody has turned on the camera to monitor the kid because they were under the impression the kid might be a drug dealer or something. Uh, they got sued for that. So the abuse is there and it's available. People have already gotten in trouble for using this technology. Okay? Is any of the stuff that I've talked about today a surprise for anybody in here? No? Not really? Because we've seen it all in the news, right? Now there's, of course, the method by which it's presented in which people come out and they use, again, words like secretive, hidden, and uh, clandestine, and all of this terminology that's used, but really it's not. It's there and it's seeping slowly. And every few years, the technology changes just a little bit, and it just becomes more and more part of your life, and slowly it becomes integrated, and you just get used to it. Okay? If somebody were to sit there with anything else like a smell, and just start exposing you to it slowly, you get used to it. You know, it might bother you at first, but the longer they do it, the more they do it, eventually you get used to it. I mean, there's roads out here where people live in houses right next to the cow farm. They got used to it. There are people who are willing to buy houses out there and live right across the street from a place that has hundreds of cows and either they can't smell or eventually the smell doesn't bother them. <laughs> so let's go over some of these answers. So, what is the trusted execution environment? Well, it's a secure area of a main processor that guarantees code and data loaded inside is confidential and it's part of the whole. But it doesn't mean necessarily oh my God. you have access to it, okay? It doesn't mean that it's secure in your data, it's somebody else's data being secure oh. from you. What about out of band management or system access? So, what is it? It's system access is a dedicated management channel for device maintenance that allows the system admin to monitor and manage servers by remote control even when those machines are powered off or otherwise non-functional. The computer can still be off, but as long as the computer is plugged in, that secondary operating system is still running and still has access to everything on your network. Intel Active Management Technology is a proprietary tool produced by Intel to provide out-of-band management through the deployment of a separate microprocessor not normally exposed to the user. This allows the monitoring, maintenance, update, upgrade, and repair of a system from a remote location even when the OS is otherwise not accessible. Critical firmware vulnerabilities exist in Intel AMT, Intel Standard Manageability, and Intel Small Business Technology enabled devices. And attackers have the ability to remotely gain access to PCs and devices that use these technologies. Intel Active Management Technology is a proprietary remote control system baked into Intel CPUs that provides full access to the system at a sub-ring zero level. And this technology has no public oversight and is not free software. So what do we do if we're concerned about this situation? How are we going to handle it? What are, what are some of the things that we can do? Well, we can always switch to a new method of communication, right? Anybody ever seen this? Pizza. Ah, that, right? Over. We moved to using carrier pigeons for all of our data, and it's already drawn out for it. So, it should be pretty easy to implement, right? Can we use carrier rats in New York? <laughs> well, we need to understand that we now build computers that require computers to work in tandem in order to provide basic operations. That's what we have. We have computers, four computers, two computers. And these devices require experts to describe their use and are almost impossible to use at a level that is not far abstracted from the hardware itself. And again, okay, yeah, I'm the guy that hates JavaScript, and I really like the Commodore 64. But I want to zoom in on this. Assembly language for kids. You got that book? Nice. There was a point in time where with computers, you would actually purchase a book and you would sit there and you would learn what your hardware does, where those hardware connections are. And they had books for kids 
to teach you assembly language. You understood what the system did at a very low level. And of course, there was stuff like, hey, things you can do, or assembly language, tips and tricks, you know, how do I make a text editor? But none of this stuff really exists anymore. We don't have a way of very easily explaining some of these concepts to people who need to know what is going on. We just don't. And remember, We used computers in 1969 to put people on the moon, unless you're one of those people who want to argue and say that we never went to the moon. <laughs> but that's for a different class. That wasn't even what I had. We never went to that class. <laughs> <laughs> this right here is the Apollo 11 code base that shows you with very minimal programming, and minimal meaning, not a whole lot of abstraction. This is very, very simplistic command and control of these systems. We were able to guide a rocket to the moon and do all of the things that we did off of some very, very small, very, very weak systems compared to what we have now. These were rudimentary commands, but we now require multi-gigahertz systems with trusted computing modules and processors within processors attached to wireless that's communication a, devices in order well. to facilitate ship posting and uploading images of our sexual organs to dating sites. We have to have a whole lot of technology to do a whole lot of nothing now. That Intel management engine is not, should not be targeted at the home market and does not provide a benefit that could not be better emulated with something more open sourced and removed from the baked in mess that is our motherboards. If you need remote management, system monitoring, and all of the tools provided by IMG Pro, if you need a professional level of computing, then you should be allowed to purchase those tools and implement them as you see fit. There should be no problem with that. If you need remote access to that system, great. But for those of us who do not need those tools, they should not be sneaking quietly into our systems and left into the back door. And for those of you, again, thinking to yourselves that they will simply switch to AMD, because we spent a lot of time taking on Intel today. <coughs> Excuse me. AMD is already beginning the process of adding those ARM processors and Minix and so on and so forth to their systems as well. Okay? So all of that integration is going to be in their systems you will not be able to get away from it. Test no maybe escape. Concerned that maybe some of these things that have been added by Intel and now AMD were, were required by the Federal Code. I'm glad that you asked that because we're just about to get into that. Kind of what so, I don't know what's up with Australia, but they say a lot of stuff online. Like a lot of stuff. Australia is just like really just they just say things. So I went to Australia, so, and I'm not I'm not talking about just the public. I'm talking about their government too. Like everybody in Australia, just like they just put it out there. So this is the actual Five Eyes ministerial brief from Australia. So they went to a Five Eyes meeting, and then they took notes about everything and just posted it to the internet. Okay. Okay. Which is that's awesome for us. I tried to see if I could find the U.S. equivalent to this, and surprise, surprise, I was unable to do so. So if you were able to do so, please let me know, because I would love to read our version of it. Well, it's going to be quick, so you can get something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happens in here? Well, if you read this, you will find out that what they have done is they have begun a process of asking very nicely for these companies to do what they want. They're not going to pass a law. They're not going to do anything, they say. They're just letting them know these are the things that we need access to. And so we need access to encryption. We need access to people's computers. We need access to all of this stuff. Can you give it to us, please? <laughs> Got it. And then surprise, Got it. surprise, when you have something as powerful as a government, step in and tell your business that they need to do something for you. You're not going to believe it, but most of these businesses are willing to do so. And undoubtedly, there is probably a monetary reason for it. If you as a company want to continue to do business, you're going to do what is necessary for you to be allowed to do business, right? 
but they're not forcing anybody to do it, so the oversight is different. They haven't passed the law. They're not forcing you to do it. They're not doing any of those things. But you have these groups who are saying that for a free and open and secure internet, all terms that we would like to use in here, right? Well, they use those terms too. But for that stuff to still exist, they're going to need to be able to read our stuff. They need access to our information. They need to know what's going on out in the world for them to have access to all of this. And so for the only way for them to be able to do that is for these companies to provide them backdoor access in the form of tools like active management, pushing this out to all the houses. And to be honest with you, it's much easier this way, don't you think? The only thing better than having remote access to these systems is to take those, those systems that are remote and to bring them in-house, which is why my prediction, excuse me, my prediction is that eventually we're going to move to cloud services specifically so they just have every bit of the information in-house and they don't have to force it at home anymore. Because that's kind of a waste of bandwidth, right? If you could just work on the data and then sync it up to them, it would be much easier and much more simplistic for them than to have to actually go out and pull that data when they actually need it. But that's where we're at right now. We're at a position where these agencies get together and they discuss what they want access to and then they go out and they tell these companies it would be really nice if you did this for us. And then the companies comply. And that's where we're at. And then the oversight is different, right? The people who are looking at those deals are different because you're not passing a law to force these companies to do it. You're just asking. They're doing it. They're complying. So, counter to that, something where we can take some control back. CPU is still CPU, probably. Uh, next cloud, Freedom Box, and a lot of projects like that, the free software projects out there, where we can provide our own cloud services to, to some extent. Uh, so that like when you take pictures on your phone, it's just syncing up to Dropbox or Google or whoever. It syncs up to your own Nextbox uh, service that you run. And I agree with you, and I'm a huge proponent of that. I'm a huge proponent, and I've told lots of people like mail in a box, super cool, makes it very easy for you to run your own email server, your own next cloud. It combines all of those things into a very easy uh, and simplified method for somebody who's not used to running like their own mail server to be able to accomplish that. However, with everything that we've learned here today, and knowing that these are all running on virtual machines that are owned by somebody else, right, because you're, you are going out and you're buying hosting, and I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you, when I recommend hosting to people, who do I recommend? Mm -hmm. Scaleways? Right? Me? And where's Scaleways? France? And who's a member of Five Eyes? France! Absolutely. You can also run them on a Raspberry Pi, which doesn't have the, at least as far as I know, it doesn't have the management engines, it doesn't have the, so have a bit of an execution. So, a counter argument to that, Britain just passed a law that is going to require any technology coming out of Britain to have some form of backdoor in it. Now, Ooh. that potentially, yes, we have a finite number of Raspberry Pis that are secured uh, from that kind of threat, potentially, maybe, right now. But eventually that will dry up as whatever changes that are mandatory change. And again, I'm not trying to like push the depression on everybody. Oh man, everything sucks and everything's on fire. But I want to make sure that everybody knows and is aware. Like as we look for ways to get around this stuff, they're looking for ways of putting us back in the box. It's like if you've ever looked at uh, crawfish and you've got a whole bunch of crawfish in a bowl and they're all trying to climb out, but then somebody's always trying to pull them back down and they just get out. We're sort of in that similar digital situation. Like we're looking for methods of getting out from that box, of being able to get away from that kind of situation. But again, the Raspberry Pi is wonderful technology. I tell all my students to get one. I show them to all kinds of people. I've given them as gifts. I've handed them to kids that I know so that they can start learning programming. I love the Raspberry Pi, but with the laws that are changing overseas, eventually that finite resources that finite resource of Raspberry Pis, that's going to dry up. 
in terms of Raspberry Pis that are not that doors in some way. Ew. So, final recommendation? Well, obviously I'm always going to tell you to use Linux. But just keep in mind that what you're running Linux on could potentially be a problem. Now, I did purchase the, the Free Software Foundation was sort of shilling a computer. It's like a little compute module. It looks like a little disket and it goes into a system and it's supposed to be good for the environment. It's supposed to be uh, safe from back doors and all of this different stuff that they're claiming. I bought one. It's supposed to come in in a month or two. When it gets here, I'm going to do a talk about it or I'm going to do a big breakdown of it on my blog. So one or the other, at some point I'll show it to everybody. I can't tell you whether it's safe or not. I don't know. I have no way of looking at the chipset. I can't pop it open and use a microscope on it or anything like that. But the Free Software Foundation says it's pretty cool, so I'm going to look at it. So the Free Software Foundation has a respect your freedom category. Correct, which is it. Including for hardware. Uh -huh. uh, so they've gone through and done some vetting of those organizations, those companies, and their hardware and their software to say that there is a spy stuff. Doesn't mean that, that something didn't get noticed, but um, they are at least trying to, to help us find hardware that we can see. And, and work with organizations that are claiming they're following that, like Purism and, and other yeah. organizations. I don't know how Purism is going to do, and I know what they're, they're doing a cell phone too, right? Uh, the problem with the cell phone being that the baseband modem is still going to be proprietary. There's no baseband modem operating system but the baseband modem essentially functions as negative ring. So they're, they're working on that. So a couple things again. One, the phone will have hardware uh, disconnects for the phones and for the, or for the uh, microphones and the cameras. Okay. So you can turn it off the spy stuff that way with physical connections. Uh, but then on the modem, their initial plan was to have one that would be free software. Uh, and they ran into some problems. Uh, somebody just told me they delayed it, so maybe they're fixing things, I don't know. But their goal is still to have the free software stack for the modem. Okay. Um, it just, last I saw two months ago, uh, they weren't, they probably were not gonna have that out of the game. Okay. But then the game moved, so. Sure. Uh, so yeah, so essentially you and I both, no idea if that's actually gonna be part of it. Uh, understand your hardware a lot about some of the different stuff that's integrated into Intel chipset. If you're looking at AMD, figure out what's going on. I discussed the stuff that's happening with the Raspberry Pi and the laws within uh, Britain and the way things are changing there. Uh, same thing with the Free Software Foundation computer that I'm looking at getting. That is made overseas in Britain. So then that is a concern because they have laws that say that they have to ship this thing with back doors in it, but then it's supposed to be Free Software Foundation certified and I don't know how that's going to work. Uh, Understand your OS. Find out what's going on. What OS are you running? What OS is available in your system? In addition to that, think about the peripherals. Your router, right? We have Internet of Things connected within our network. We have methods by which pivot can happen. And I talk about pivot all the time. But just because you think that your system is secure, and maybe it is, maybe you're sitting around at home with a keyboard and a mouse hooked up to a Sega Dreamcast running NetBSD, and you're like, you know what? I don't have to worry about my processor. I don't have to worry about anything. The stuff that is surrounding your network could still potentially be the flaw that is necessary to pivot to getting the information from the secure system that you are using. Read. I linked you a ton of stuff. You guys have a lot of things to read. Read it. And then finally, learn to search. Because that's what we're really doing. I found out about what's going on in Australia simply by searching until I found the Australian data, and then I read about it, and then I found more data, and it was just pivoting from news source to news source until I found the actual press release from the Australian government, and then I archived it and I gave it to you all. Do the same thing. Any questions? No? Okay. Scared? <laughs> Dann sind wir Sorry durch hier, La langsam fast. Ne? Uh, well, I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, we'll start closing down. I apologize that this was about 30 minutes. Wir sind hier auf Laser geguckt mit der IP 149 But, uh, zum 202.137.134, dem uh, Anarchie-Server ohne Regeln, Pure Vanilla. Really And that's where we're in a 
bit of a pickle right now. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, I guess that closes it out. You know, uh, das war Aaron Jones' Introduction to Secure Computing auf dem Brian Clough Channel. Link ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. Ähm, Alternativ zu der IP, Aopsa, oh, gibt es auch die Domain sillyhoon.com. Ähm, genau, falls äh, die IP oder die Domain sich ändert, gibt es wahrscheinlich auf dem Kanal ein äh, neues Video, was ein Update macht oder in der Beschreibung wird das aktualisiert. Ähm, das heißt, wenn ihr das Video in... Äh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Jahren seht, könnte es sein, dass es sich äh, geändert hat. Ähm, und sonst äh, würde ich sagen, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge dieser Dauerwerbesendung. Und ähm, ja, ciao.